as the 60s were coming to a close, there were still four acts that I wanted to see and hopefully meet. That would be Santana, Mountain with Humble Pie, Leslie West on guitar, The Rolling Stones with B.B. King, and then The Grateful Dead on New Year's Eve. To set the stage, I'm going to have to go back in time. And I will dial up the musical time machine to November 1969. It is there the story begins. Now, the 60s had been an incredible generation for music. We had the Beatles and the British Invasion, Yardbirds, Kinks, Stones, etc., Dave Clark Five, you name it. But the Beatles were the predominant group with the Rolling Stones. By the time we got to the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967, bands had been writing their own material for years. They used to go to Ten Pan Alley in New York where all of the songwriters were at the Brill Building and they'd get a hit song and then they'd go record it and have a pop single and that would be it. But with the Beatles, they started writing their own material and a lot of groups followed suit. So by the time we got to Monterey Pop Festival in 67, a lot of the groups that were going to continue on into the 70s and be mega stars were performing. Of course, we had the breakout of Janis Joplin with Big Brother and the Holding Company. There was Crosby, Stills and Nash, who would become Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and also perform at Woodstock. There was the Jimi Hendrix experience. He blew everybody's mind. So did Otis Redding. He achieved national stardom after that. And there were other groups like the Jefferson Airplane and Moby Grape and the Electric Flag. That was a heck of a group. Mike Bloomfield's band with Harvey Brooks and Nick Grevenites on vocals and Barry Goldberg on keyboard. A lot of the guys from the Butterfield band. Buddy Miles on drums. They were an incredible group. They only did four songs at the festival, but that was okay. It was enough to get that album that was released in 68 out into the public a lot more. Ravi Shankar was around for years, but he did not reach the, the pop stardom that these other groups did. But when you look at Santana and The Who and all of the groups that we saw at Newport, Jeff Tull and Jimmy Page and The Yardbirds, Jeff Beck group. I think the future was set for guitar dominated bands going forward into the 70s. Now, the Boston Tea Party was still launching acts before they made it to the concert venue stage. The 60s had been good to several of my blues idols such as Muddy Waters and James Cotton, but others such as T-Bone Walker didn't really get the recognition that they needed. Richie Havens did break out at Woodstock. That was great. So at the Boston Tea Party though, still for $3.50, you could see the best groups before they made it to the arenas. Number 13th to 15. Santana and the Grand Funk Railroad were scheduled to play at the Boston Tea Party. The hype over the Grand Funk Railroad was just 
through the roof and they had a big Times Square ad for months up there. I personally did not like them at all. And there was a story about them playing at the Royal Albert Hall in England and people started booing them. And Mark Farner, the guitar player, said, if anybody out there can play guitar as good as I can, come up here right now. Eric Clapton was in the audience. He got out of his chair, went to the wings, walked straight out onto the floor. The place went wild, the crowd went crazy, and Mark Farner took a hike. Nevertheless, the Grand Funk Railroad was opening for Santana and I had to endure them. When they cleared off the stage and Santana came in and they started off and Greg Rowley on the organ came in and Mike Shreve, 20 year old drummer, came in. The, the conga, the percussion, and then Santana came in with his lead. The place was rocking. The first time you experienced kind of Latino rock, if you will, the fantastic rhythms of the Caribbean mixed with rock, San Francisco style. Man, I just couldn't believe what a great group they were. Of course, I had the album. WBCN in Boston had been playing it, so we were all ready. And then when they came out, they were so colorful. The bass player was real tall and he had a it, one of these hats that was kind of rainbowed out. And They just were a colorful band and they played the hell out of that album. Man, they were fantastic. I was so glad I saw them. I didn't get to meet Carlos, but I did get to see him play two sets, two shows, standing from here to where you're sitting away. And that was unbelievable. Now, November 20th to the 22nd, Mountain with Leslie West, the great guitar player, produced by Felix Papillardi, the organ player who also produced The Young Rascals and was in The Rascals, and Humble Pie with Steve Marriott came to the tea party. Then when Leslie West went into Mississippi Queen, he had a 58 Les Paul Jr. I got the one just like it, and I still have the pickup I took off of it. Everybody knows that doo 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 doo. That riff, Mississippi Queen. The rest of their songs were kind of so-so for me, but that really established him as a true American guitar player with really great blues rock tone. Now, Humble Pie, they're a group of legends, and they had, man, just so many great players. It was an incredible treat to be right up front with them. The Rolling Stones took Chuck Berry's song, Oh Carol, and made it a rock classic. Now at this time, they had the great Mick Taylor in the band. As you recall, the John Mayall and the Blues Breakers he had Eric Clapton, Peter Green, and then finally on Mayall's Crusade album, he had an 18-year-old Mick Taylor. Driving Sideways was a fabulous song. He also did an incredible version of Old Pretty Women. So to me, he gave the Stones legitimacy because I had seen them in 
65 at the uh, Rhode Island Auditorium. And that was way back before they had any type of sound system. And it was just all noise and reverberation. Now at the Boston Garden, I knew the sound was going to be terrific. Security was very high. And it was going to be difficult to meet Mick Taylor. So I went over by B.B. King's dressing room. And as one of his band members was coming in and out, I walked in with him. And B.B. was sitting there and I walked over and I said, Mr. King, I'm Forrest Howie McDonald. It is such an honor to meet you, sir. And he said, oh boy, you don't have to be so polite. You can call me B.B. And we exchanged some pleasantries. And right then, Mick Taylor walked in. Terry Reed was on the stage. So I said, wow, here is my chance to meet Mick Taylor too. So I, I quickly jumped in between him and B.B. and introduced myself and told him how much I loved his guitar work. And then he got in and started talking to B.B. And of course, the thrill is gone was out. And that was B.B.'s first big hit album. And it propelled him into the arena tour playing with the Rolling Stones. So I did compliment B.B. on his incredible playing through all of the years. Told him he was a big inspiration to me. And then my time had come to back on out of there because B.B. was going to go on in about 10 minutes and he and Mick wanted to talk so I split and went out to get ready for B.B.'s set. B.B. got to play six songs. The two songs that stood out most to me were I Got a Mind to Give Up Living and That's Why I Sing the Blues by B.B. Yes, I say everybody wanna know. He just did an incredible job and had everyone in stitches. Now, we had a little break and the Rolling Stones came out. And this was during the tour, if anyone saw the Rolling Stones movie, where he said, oh, a button on my trousers is busted. Y'all don't want my trousers to fall down now, do ya? And the crowd laughed, got a big joke out of it. But their set included all of the classics that were going to be on Let It Bleed and Get Your Yaya's Out. Get Your Yaya's Out came out a year later and it was all live recordings from this tour. But they did Honky Tonk Woman, Midnight Rambler. Give Me Shelter, Love in Vain, Jumpin' Jack Flash, They were just on fire and they brought the crowd to their feet again and again and again. This was the Rolling Stones to me at their peak. They all looked good. They could all still play. Ian Stewart also accompanied them on piano that night. And I think it was, for me, the peak of the Rolling Stones. A month later they played in Altamont, a free show, and the Hells Angels were the bodyguards and several people got killed, and their reputation was a little bit tarnished after that. The final show that I was looking forward to seeing was the Grateful Dead at the Boston Tea Party on New Year's Eve. Now, I wasn't really a big Grateful Dead fan, I'll be honest. Their songs just went on forever and didn't really have a lot of arrangement or finality to it. But Anthem of the Sun was a big Jerry Garcia classic and they were well known for being an LSD band. And that night at the tea party, it was rumored that all of the punch in the club had been dosed with acid.
So when the band came out, I was waiting for Jerry Garcia. I wanted to talk to him. So they were approaching the stage, and I, I jumped in, I introduced myself, and uh, I could tell he was really tripping heavy. And after uh, maybe a minute and a half, I said, Jerry, I've got a joint of some great Mishmakan. You want to smoke it? And he said, give it to someone who needs it. <laughs> Which was pretty indicative of where the crowd was at at the moment. I waited till they started up and I decided I needed it and <laughs> fired it up. But New Year's Eve came and went. Midnight, the clock struck down, the dead were still playing. They went on into the morning and that ended the 60s, the whole decade of rock and roll. All of that had a tremendous influence on me. In fact, it would not be many years after that that I almost stopped listening to anybody because my influence was set. My compass was honed. I had seen everybody I wanted to see. I knew what I wanted to do and the direction was rock and roll, baby, straight ahead. So thanks for coming along on this story. I appreciate you being with me. And I wanna remind you, keep love in your heart, a song in your head. And if you like the video, please hit the like button, subscribe, and smash the bell so you know when the next cool story is coming out. All right, thanks so much. We'll see you again next time on the Story Highway. Take care.